Welcome to part one of two episodes centered around a class I'm in right now called Gospel Catechesis. Unfortunately, we do not have Daniel with us in this episode, but Joel is here. Hello. And also joining us for the conversation today is our cousin, Caleb Sigler. Let me clarify, since the last time we had a special guest, it was a cousin as well. That's right. This is a Sigler cousin this time, so on our dad's side of the family. Um, last time it was Christian Hemi, who is on our mom's side of the family. So we're just reaching to our uh, various cousins <laughs> to fill in when needed. <laughs> So we brought on Caleb uh, because we're talking about catechesis today. That's a word that a lot of people might not be familiar with. We touched on it a little bit with our other cousin, Christian, in episode six. But yeah, essentially catechesis is the teaching of the Christian faith, and we'll get more into that. But the reason we have Caleb is because he is a worship leader who's been leading worship for many years, and so he has a lot of awesome practical church ministry experience. And so we're going to be talking to him about how you teach the faith and what just practical ministry looks like. So why don't we start by you just telling people a little bit about who you are. Sure. Um, Well, first of all, I appreciate you guys having me on here. We've enjoyed listening to the other ones. These are great. These are a lot of fun. So I appreciate you doing that. So I I live in Memphis, Tennessee um, with my wife, Casey. And my two daughters, um, Evangeline, we call her Evie, and Gwendolyn, we call her Gwen, and um, our dog, Patsy. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we've been here for about 13 years. We have been a part of, uh, this will be our fourth church plant since then. Uh, so we're now at a church called Mosaic Church. Initially, um, I, I didn't want to be in Memphis, so I, I, we had tried to kind of leave it. I was actually driving one day, and one of the most clear, audible times I've heard the Lord <laughs> say, hey, turn here, it was the weirdest thing, and I said, okay, Lord, and I turned, and um, I ended up in our neighborhood that I'm, we're currently in, and he's, he basically was like, here, and we didn't know what that meant for a long time, and so we we moved into that neighborhood before we were part of a church plant, and God has just continue to bring us ministry. Um, it's just been really faithful to do that. So we're really grateful. So we, yeah, we love our church and, um, yeah, I've, I've led worship. My dad was a worship pastor. Um, he passed away during COVID, but he was a worship pastor for, oh, 40 years. I think it was something like that crazy yeah. amount of time, um, 45, something like that. And, um, you know, that was something that we grew up in and around and, right. you know, that's continued on into our lives. And so I've done it. I've led mm-hmm. now the last vocationally, I guess I've led for almost 15 years now, which is cool. Wow. And, um, and then you're also a graphic designer. Correct. That is correct. Yeah. You know, I feel like music ministry is just part of my ministry. Um, mm. My way of connecting with the world um, has been through my work. Um, and so I've gotten to be in really, um, dark places and, Mm. um, gotten to be with lots of, I'm with non-believers all day, every day, which is awesome. And I get to be salt and light to them. Um, it's really cool how God has kind of brought all that together to make part of the whole. It's not what I planned, but it's better than I could have imagined. So, yep. I think it's really cool just in general, how, the more you're ministry minded, no matter what you're doing, like it becomes a ministry. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And so we see that a lot of times with people in our church who they've like, well, they'll stay in the same job that they've been in mm-hmm. forever. But then like God really transforms their life and gives them eyes to see their, what they're doing as ministry. And it like has a whole new look. And they're like, wow, all of a sudden I'm like, I'm a minister, but I'm doing the same thing I've always right. done. You know? Right. Mm-hmm. We yeah, were all called good. to ministry, every single one of us, you know, um, that's not just a vocational thing. And so, yeah, it should be every part of your life. Before we jump into the topic, I want to talk a little bit more about your background upbringing. Cool. You mentioned a little bit about church and ministry being a huge part of your life because of your dad, which is fun because obviously that's similar to our experience yeah. with our dad being a pastor and church planter. But with your dad, it was the worship side. So I'm interested in how your childhood and upbringing looked. Like you guys, most of our lives growing up early on was in the church. I was telling um, someone yesterday, I forget who it was, 
uh, that my brother and I used to, after every service, we would kind of army crawl down the underneath all of the pews. <laughs> and that was like part of our Sunday ritual. And then we'd also kind of walk around <laughs> in, in the, the choir loft, which churches don't have choir lofts anymore, but they used to. That's the thing. There's choirs back in the day. Anyways, uh, we right. would walk around the choir lofts and we would... Um, <laughs> look for the the lemon cough drops that people would leave because they were like candies and we would try like just like shotgun as many of them we could find and we'd find them you know so so yeah i mean er, early early memories are us being in and around the Mm -hmm. church community and early early memories is people being in our homes too so it wasn't you know it wasn't Mm -hmm. just it wasn't just on sundays but my dad was a choir director and um, orchestra director, and so it's a little bit different than what I do now. I'm, I'm more of a contemporary worship leader. Um, right. I never knew anything different, so I didn't realize that no one else really grew up the way that we did, where we were at church <laughs> all the time, except for because also all of our cousins are like this too. So we just like, oh, this is what it's like, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just do that. You go to church and all the time. Yeah. But I, you know, my dad was. In in the uh, 80s, I guess, mid-80s, um, he's part of a church in uh, Richmond, Virginia. This was still when there was, even, even really before the, like, worship wars that you may have heard of, where the people were kind of fighting over, like, traditional and non-traditional, all that stuff. Yeah. At the time, that was a big deal. And so he was early on doing contemporary worship in a church up there. Um, and so, you know, that was really important to us and... Um, he had a singing very early. I think I was four when I first sang in front of the church, did a solo in front of the church. Wow. That was a big part of like our lives. I mean, there's always music in our house and I mean, yeah. he would, we'd be on road trips and he'd turn off the radio and go, okay. And he would just start singing. And what he <laughs> meant was that me and Josh were supposed to start harmonizing with him so that we would like, and that was just how we learned how to sing. And we were just like trying to figure it out, you know, so, yeah, so so that cool. was a big major part of our lives. But then of course, all of our extended family, seeing all of that, mm-hmm. it's uh, when I try to describe our family to people, people are like, what? I'm like, yeah, my cousins are all in ministry. My <laughs> uncles are all in ministry. My dad was in ministry. My grandpa, my great, great, grandpa. right. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, wow. Yeah. So. Um, so probably fun. similar to a lot of y'all's lives as well. So then uh, when uh, did you start feeling a personal call toward ministry and worship leading? I'll be honest. I fought that. I mm. kind of didn't want to go into the family business, which is why I thought I wanted to go into music business, which mm. uh, made that made more sense to me. I was interested. I, I'm a songwriter as well. And so I thought that's what I want to do. I want to create. I don't really just want to go and lead for people. Yeah, my very first time I led worship was at actually at a, a like a high school Christian organization, um, hmm. and um, I had sung a little bit in church and choir and stuff like that, but I had never led worship before. And I had just started playing guitar, and someone asked me to do it, and I was terrible, but I learned the songs and I got up there. And so my first <laughs> my first leading to, leading worship was about three or four hundred people in front of three or four hundred people. Wow, playing songs really poorly. Wow. <laughs> you know, I'm grateful for my dad because he really helped me through a lot of that early on. Mm. And then I had a great youth group that I would I would was definitely part of their worship band and um, yeah. did a lot of that. So I, I definitely remember a time at Asbury, the first almost year of Asbury College when I was there, um, mm. and I was there in the early 2000s. I didn't lead at all. We actually had sort of a, a, a mini revival time that happened when we, I was there. That was really hmm. exciting. It was about four or five days where we didn't even have classes. People just, it was like 24 hour prayer and worship that wow. kind of happened, initially happened spontaneously at As- Asbury. That's a really cool story. I, I started leading there again a little bit. Um, but I think it was really when we moved back to Memphis and I started feeling that call to this neighborhood. Mm. And I started leading with with this group um, for a church plant called um, Christ City Church. That didn't go quite the way I hoped to, but it, it that one of the big things is it kind of reignited my heart for worship, um, and that's just kind of stuck since then. I felt passion about that since then, um, and mm. you know I think it's grown as as my love for the church has grown, as my love for my city has grown, and my love for my my now family has grown. You know the need to see um, Jesus exalted in every aspect of our life um, became just a deep passion of mine. So, yeah. And so now that's what I do. Awesome. Nice. 
So I'm in a class right now called Gospel Catechesis. And uh, catechesis is kind of a not commonly used word. So Thankfully. just to... <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> Yeah, the first day of class was like, okay, what do people think of when they hear the word catechesis? And, you know, varying responses. But one student's like, uh, sounds like a type of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wasn't super familiar with, with the word either. But essentially, it's just the idea of teaching the essentials of the Christian faith, often in preparation for baptism. Mm -hmm. In the early church, they would have an up to three year process of teaching that would lead up to a convert being baptized into the faith. But the word itself, catechesis, means like echo or resound. So it's this idea of just orally passing down something again and again with repetition mm -hmm. um, to teach. Traditionally, the main components of catechesis are the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, the creeds, and the sacraments. I would say, like, w we often, like, think of catechesis in the form of discipleship. Like, that's the word that's used most often in the contemporary ch church. Yeah. Is discipleship. There is a little bit of difference. Discipleship is more focused on the practical components of, like, living out the faith and following mm. Jesus in a practical way. And catechesis is a little bit more about, like, learning the truth of Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. So that's like how you kind of distinguish those a little bit. There's definitely a lot of overlap. And so we we definitely just talk about discipleship at our church. Mm -hmm. But through discipleship, we do our catechesis type stuff in discipleship mostly. Yeah, that's definitely the aspect that I was more familiar with. I think that's a helpful distinction. So specifically from the perspective of someone who's in the worship leading, the worship focus of a church what it, what are your thoughts on what it looks like to do catechesis to teach the faith um, to help people understand what it actually means to be a christian yeah through worship i think it's crucial first of all so let me start by saying that i didn't say this in my background but you know my dad we we are wesleyan people <laughs> but we have <laughs> grown up in multiple church <laughs> communities, um, which I have yeah. found to be such a gift um, for me personally. And I think it's, yet again, one of those things that's made sense of what I'm doing currently. But uh, mm -hmm. we, we actually grew up in a Presbyterian church that, um, in, in Richmond, Virginia. And That's um, something that's kind of interesting about being the child of a worship director, yeah. is that's more of a potential, that's right? That's right. That's right. Where like it, when you're a pastor's kid, you're, you're your theology of, is like... Yeah, it's here. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> but are. in worship leading, people are like, well, he believes differently, but that's okay. Right. He can still lead worship. That's right. That's right. right. So that's, that's cool. That's right. And uh, so one of the things that was really neat about them, the Presbyterian Church still does this, is they actually do a formal catechism with all of their... Um, their children. Okay. And so when I was in first grade, I th no, that's not right. Maybe fifth grade, fifth grade. Um, I went through catechism and it was like a two year thing where we had to memorize. Wow. Um, they had a little booklet that we had to memorize and then you had to recite it. They'd ask, you know, these questions and, you know, it's funny. Like, I don't think I could hmm. tell you exactly all of the, the questions word from word. If you, if you, mm -hmm. you know, but I have found, and I didn't. I, I picked up one of them recently. My mom still had, I think, my old one at her house, and I was kind of flipping through it the other day, and I was like, "Oh, I still talk like this." So much of my <laughs> theology was built on this season of my life, um, and then when we moved to, mm. to Memphis, we went through. And a lot of Methodist churches don't do this anymore, but we used to, we went through confirmation, yeah, which mm -hmm. is kind of met the Methodist version of catechism. Yep, that's so right. I, <laughs> I was baptized by a Methodist pastor, which is our grandpa, in a Presbyterian church, catechized at a Presbyterian church, confirmed in a Methodist church, and then <laughs> I, I'll keep going from there. But it's, it gets, it gets, I'm, a, I'm a mud of, of that a little bit. But and I think it's been really good for that because so much of, um, as my faith has grown, like, and to sit, in, sit under this. Mm. So uh, yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's incredibly crucial to that. So much so that even though our church doesn't do um, at this time, although we, we've talked about this maybe being something in the future, a, a formal catechism for our children, um, most mm -hmm. of um, our small groups, or we call them city groups in our, our area, which are just mm -hmm. groups, of, smaller groups of people within the church who are kind of 
discipling and, and encouraging each other in the faith. Um, and it's done in the kind of a family setting. We eat together and it's great. Um, that our children each week mm. go through um, a really great catechism that pastor in New York called Tim Keller, uh, his team produced called New City Catechism. Um, the reason hmm. we use New City um, is they have uh, music with all of it. So all of the song, all of the the questions are set to pretty good, mu- really obnoxiously catchy music that um, the kids <laughs> from really early on, so like little little kids up until you know sixth graders and whatever, are still able to kind of interact with this hmm. this this catechism and, and learn these these things. That's um, cool. Yeah. So hmm. that's definitely a part of of that, and that's you know you see it in our kids. So. I have more to say, but I, I don't want to talk the whole time. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're the guest, right? Okay, so. fair enough. I mean, enough. that leads in to one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, it, which is what have you found to be the, the most effective arenas to teach this? So that's cool that you're talking about what it looks like with kids, but are there any other specific arenas that you feel like you've seen this be effective? Yeah, Absolutely. So one of the convictions I had a couple of years ago as a worship pastor was just starting to look at what kind of songs I was singing um, mm. and what, why does this matter? So um, What a novel idea, right? Right, that's right. <laughs> but um, it is, but it is novel. A lot it, of, unfortunately, it a is. A lot of worship leaders just sing, oh, other churches sing this, so that means so it's okay or it's fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, what's the most recent contemporary worship song? Right. That's right. That's right. Well, it it really hit me hard. I was sitting, we, there was a, I remember this pretty vividly, this, this lady that since uh, moved, so she's not a part of our church anymore, but she was led into faith and baptized in our our church. Um, she Mm. didn't grow up a Christian and we were kind of asking her, like working her towards, um, that. And some of the questions we started asking her about her faith, all of her answers were lyrics to worship songs that I had sang. And wow, that was pretty intense because some of it was not the best. <laughs> and I was like, well, that is true. And we do sing that. And but I don't know if that's the answer to this question. But, you know, so it really kind of convicted me to go, OK, well, you know, if this is shaping um, not just what we personally who those of us who already have a background, a framework, believe about God, imagine what it's doing for the people who have never grown up in the church. And our church is very mm-hmm. passionate about seeing not just. Christians who've been Christians for a long time finding another church home, but people who yeah. are who have never heard the gospel and never mm. been a part of a church family, and yeah, and that's a lot more work, you know. But it's 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 good work, you know. And so, yeah, your story of having a formal catechism and confirmation that's right. definitely rare today. That's right. That's right. That's Even not... among people that grew up in the church, I mean, right. there are over four hundred references to singing in the Bible. And a lot of them are actual commands to do that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, and and then, oh, well, you know, this is interesting. So I, we found my, my wife homeschools our children, which I'll grow up homeschool, right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Um, so y'all, y'all done it. And part of the way that they do it in the younger kids' life is it's a lot of memoriza- memorization of stuff. Like they aren't quite at the point where they're able to like really take hold of big concepts, but they're just kind of learning facts. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And the way they do it um, is through music. And so um, they're memorizing all of these facts about history and theology and they're learning Latin. I mean, all sorts of stuff through through these songs that they sing constantly wow. with each other. And it's great. And the, you know, the, the thought process is, is that when you're when music is happening, both your right and your left brain are being activated. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's better for memorization. Like it's scientifically proven to, mm-hmm. to, to help you remember things better. And mm-hmm. so as a worship leader, and you think about that, like that's crucial. If, mm-hmm. if what I'm doing in this point is probably the part, uh, this is no knock on any sermons, but like this is probably the part in the service that they're the, at least the most active. They might actually mm-hmm. get parts of it later on and hopefully God speaks to the word and he, do, he does that, you know, but this is the time that they're probably, it's probably like sinking in really deeply into their hearts. So what, what mm-hmm. am I saying about Jesus and what are they learning about um, the faith through what I'm singing? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't always do that. Well, I'm not going to pretend like I have this perfectly down, but you know, it's still a journey of me figuring out how to do that. Well, but I think that that, yeah. that shift a couple of years ago was pretty big for me. If you start listening to, especially newer believers or like youth, I work with youth. So mm-hmm. listening to like younger believers, prayers, like mm. so many of their prayers are worship lyrics. Hmm. Yep. And you'll start hearing like 
people, they talk about God and they praise God Mm. through the words of worship songs that we sing. Mm. And that's just like you say, like that's really significant. Like that really does show how crucial it is. The things that you're singing, like that's what people then begin to see. Like this is how I pray. This is how I interact with God is based on like what I'm seeing in these worship songs. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and I think, you know, this is this is sort of a blurred line a little bit with discipleship and catechism, but as you mentioned earlier, but so our church, we're, we're, we call ourselves Mosaic, and um, that's intentional. Like, we're passionate about seeing um, people from all different backgrounds come to know Jesus and be a part of this and together, so doing community together. And we don't like to say that we're a non-denominational church. We say we're an interdenominational church, which I know some people would cringe at that, but <laughs> what you see that in the city is really beautiful because... These are people who were were deeply like. There's some things that were absolutely non-negotiable about about the heart of Jesus and and who He is and His character and the basic tenets of our faith. Um, but it allows for some different backgrounds. That's more of what we're talking about. Not necessarily crazy theologies, but like more different backgrounds of of faith, mm-hmm. um, which yeah. has been really cool. So like we have people who've come out of more of the like. Southern gospel or the black gospel, which is a totally different thing, um, or Anglican churches and Episcopal churches and Mm -hmm. Presbyterian and Baptist. And like, how do we, as the people of God, serve the people in this, this neighborhood, in this city. Right. Yeah. Um, and so like, we're, we're training that even by just visually how we're leading worship, right? Like, what does my stage say about the nature of racial reconciliation? What does my stage say about um, the heart of young and old pouring into each other? So, I mean, it sounds Mm -hmm. kind of uh, small, but it's, again, it's those things, those small things that are shaping our hearts and our minds towards that. So, Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Like as Christians, we can think about all those things, the way that the stage is set up, the way that our church buildings are constructed even, everything we do, you know, giving glory to God and pointing back to him and teaching. Mm -hmm. You, again, you see like stuff that we don't think is that important within Mm. a worship service is, is training the hearts of the people of, of, of God. Um, yeah. So what does that look like? This is important. You know, how, how, (laughs) it's kind of a, it's kind of a scary thing if you think about it (laughs) in leadership, (laughs) if you're like, Oh, what have I done? You know, have I taken this seriously? (laughs) Yeah. All you can do is be faithful and try, you know, let the Lord work in spite of, of you, hopefully. So, yeah. So when you sit down to plan a a worship set and pick your Mm -hmm. songs, what are some of the things that are going through your mind in that process? Yeah, so we adhere to the church calendar throughout the year. Mm. And I say that very loosely because um, I know there are people who... I I also went to some Anglican churches in college, and and Methodist Church has some of that structure too. But we have a general flow of of the church calendar Mm. throughout, throughout the year. And so that helps kind of and form and and the point of that is what we're talking about it's to train yep. people in in uh, the theology of the faith right that's right and so mm-hmm. like it's it's to remember the full story of Jesus every year so we go mm-hmm. we walk through the story of Jesus and what he's done for us right and then in a, in a miniature way we do that every week right so we we mm-hmm. come into um service we glorify and magnify the lord we are made aware of our sin and our need for Jesus we respond to that through um, sermon and word and communion. We take communion every week, and um, and then we're sent out into the world. Um, so, hmm. I try to each week both follow that script, that structure as much as possible. So, a lot of our songs at the beginning are a bit more of the the grander scope of God's of what He's done for us. God is good. God is awesome. A lot of those are more of our more fun, upbeat songs too, which is just kind of uh, how helpful. Yeah. But just big, bigger, ten thousand foot view vision of what who God is. Yeah. And then we kind of zoom in a little bit more as we go throughout, and then we're sent out, right? And so some of these things I'm not like I, I you, you have to bend on some of these things because sometimes it's more, a little more challenging. But I try to always stay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, there's a practical component too that you have to Right, that's right, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I always uh, attempt to stay within whatever the the sermon is about if I can. Mm. Um I mean that's a good place to start when you're picking songs anyways, if you just read the passage and a lot of times God brings out songs in your head really quickly or there's literally yeah. like, oh, that's those lyrics are in another okay, <laughs> that's that cool. song's yeah. an obvious one, you know. So that's usually a good place to start. And then um on top of that, I try to 
Um, so in Ephesians, it talks about worshiping and psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Mm. And I try to I try to adhere to that as much as I can. And so with the mindset of which they wouldn't have thought of it exactly this way, but like hymns being more of the theological like doctrinal songs, which mm. would be a lot of more of our what we'd call modern hymns. You know, I mean songs that kind of walk you through these gospel truths right you know most yeah. hymns take you through yep. a lot of really rich meaty stuff but i don't know if you've ever been to church that only sings those it's sometimes hard because you're you're just struck with this big knowledge of god and then you just don't have a moment to rest in that mm-hmm. um and so like for me that would be sort of the psalms or excuse me the, the spiritual songs like that responding um to the revelation of what god's done in our hearts right so mm-hmm. i always have a, a good mix of those as well um and then psalms are just more kind of emotional songs, songs that just kind of are heart songs, crying out to God, um, allowing the Holy Spirit just to work in that. And sometimes those are a little more repetitive. And mm. and then sometimes they actually are psalms. So we have that option too. I mean, David did a pretty good job being yeah. pretty, <laughs> an, an, emo, an emo kid early on. So I mean, he helped us out a lot. So. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, all of that's at least subconsciously going through my head as I pick songs mm. um, every week. And then there's all sorts of logistical stuff too, but that's, that's good. I think that's important to walk through also because a lot of people who go to church are aware of like, Oh, they like to start off with like a high energy song and then mm-hmm. they like to do like a slower song or whatever, mm-hmm. but people don't understand that there's like a reason. Absolutely. That. You know, it's like, it's not just like we're trying to excite people at the beginning of worship. Mm. It's that it's appropriate for us to begin with praise and like Mm. with that big view of like God's majesty. Well, and and you, I I say every week, like almost, I don't say it every week, but you you don't, you usually don't come in ready to worship. Your dad actually talks about this, which is pretty cool. We have used some of the stuff he said, just like you have to shape your heart to be expected in worship. Mm. And a lot of times people aren't, right? I mean, you hope that people are and you, you, you encourage that to happen, but so many of the people come in. They just got in a fight with their husband. They are mm-hmm. freaking out about their children because they wouldn't get dressed that morning. <laughs> um, they're worried about their finances. Someone died in their life. I mean, there's so much that there, this baggage that people are bringing into the service. And so yeah. there's a beginning at the service where you, and kind of sometimes it takes the whole service to do this, but just shaping your heart to actually want to do this. Um, yeah. There's a song by uh, um, Austin Stone in, in, in Texas, and they have a song called Jesus is Better. And the bridge of it just says, um, it, it lists all these things and all my sorrows and all my riches and all these things. Jesus is better. And that's the mm-hmm. response. But then after each one, it says, make my heart believe. And I mm-hmm. think that that's the thing that's really important. Like, I believe this, but help me believe this, right? Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's that's the important part of us coming together as a gathered church to do that. So That's good. Mm-hmm. What you're saying about the Psalms is helpful for me. I've never th- thought much about that. Because I, I can tend to be critical of songs that are repetitive mm. and more emotional, like you were saying. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's easy, easy for me to think, like, oh, there's no theological depth in this. Like, mm. w- you know, why are we really doing this? But that's a really helpful distinction for me, uh, what you just made, to take that into worship. I love how some of these modern worship uh, hymn writers, like the Gettys, have taken rich truths and then mm. given itself a chorus to it, just to kind of, well, Shane and Shane's another one that do mm-hmm. that, where they respond. Sometimes it's just saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, and that's all it is, or holy, 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 or whatever. And we're kind of like, that's kind of a weak thing to do to chorus, but I think it's intentional. How do mm. you take, you know, this is a lot to say. Let me digest this for a minute and be like, whew, isn't God good? I need to say that for a second. So Yeah. yeah. There's so much of us being able to put our entire selves into singing. Yeah. Like I'm singing, I'm choosing to sing, even if I don't necessarily feel like it, Mm -hmm. like what you're saying, like we're asking God to make us believe, to help us like worship, even if we're not feeling it. When we choose to sing, like that begins to guide our emotions and our, our heart and our mind. Right. Yeah. So worship songs are just so important in the way that they really, I guess, like our souls are involved in music. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what I'll tell my students sometimes. It's like, you know how when you're going through something, you like really, it feels good to like find a song that just embodies what you're feeling. Like mm-hmm. if you're in a bad mood, sometimes it just feels good to like listen to a sad song and be like, this is, I'm just going to dwell in my misery. You know, yeah. it just like feels good. Or like if you're having a great day, you have like this really fun song. You're like, wow, this is awesome. Like, this is what I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. And so that way that music can like go along with our, our hearts and go along with our souls. But then in worship, we're not having the music reflect what's already there. We're allowing us to like conform with the truth. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's aligning our souls and our emotions 
with the truth of, of who God is and the gospel. Amen. It's always been a part of the church, too. Contemporary worship has changed um, even since I've been alive and since I've been leading worship. You know, before that, it was more hymns and choirs and traditional stuff, which still exists as well. Gregorian chants before that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I was thinking, I was, we were, just got through the, the book of 1 Corinthians as a church, and mm. you know, I was thinking about Paul writing this stuff, and he's he's saying, remember this, and he's talk, he walks through the communion liturgy that and the night that Jesus died and all that stuff. Yeah. He's saying, remember this, as in like, you guys have already been talking about this. You've done this a bunch. But this that was one of the first written instances of, of that. So what were they doing? They're probably singing this stuff to each other. You know, they're, mm. they're remembering these these stories by singing these songs. And they would have done that in the temple. Before, like, Jesus would have sung songs, you know, to remember um, these things because we didn't have, mm. or they did have writing, but it was very rare and not many people were able to have, have access to it. And there wasn't typing and so on. Yeah. And so like the way it was passed down was through song. And that's that's not even just Christian. That goes back to lots of other traditions. I mean, almost every other tradition has some sort of person, a, a shaman or a bard or something like that, that was like the person who kept the history of of, of that group, you know? And right. so it's a crucial piece of that. And I, I don't know that all, you know, in, in, in the midst of all the kind of rock star worship stuff, which I'm not knocking on any of that right now, um, that's for another conversation, um, but... <laughs> I think we forget the importance of um, mm. us as, as, you know, being priest um, mm. and what that means mm. for us and how we're shaping people's minds and hearts. So switching gears a little bit, when I think about worship in the church, I also think about the sacraments. Mm. So I wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, we've talked a lot in this class about baptism and about communion and what those things look like and how they should be practiced. And um, I'm hoping to have a future conversation with Matt, actually, our other cousin, oh, about some of the specific theology. He's a uh, worship uh, professor at a seminary. So uh, hopefully in a future episode, we'll talk to him about some of the symbolism and theology behind the sacraments. Um, but I did want to just ask you, Caleb, how have you seen the sacraments incorporated well into our worship services? Um, so let's start with baptism. Sure. So our church, just by the nature of some of the people who help plan it, um, leans a little more I guess Baptist. I don't like saying that, but that's sort of there's sort of there's a little bit of Baptist in them, <laughs> and so you know, baptism has been a big part of that. But um, no, yeah. we 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 take it seriously. We we modeling modeling after Jesus and His baptism, and there is a requirement to kind of go through. It's not necessarily a class, but you have to go. You at least have to meet with some of our leadership team, okay. our elders or a teaching team, or um, and what do you believe about the heart of Jesus and like, what does this mean to you? And like, why, why get baptized again, you know, or, or for mm. the first time, um, what's the reasoning behind this? Um, and, uh, we do it in the middle of our service. Uh, we make okay. sure that we do it before we dismiss the children so that, um, our children get to see this happening. And, um, we, mm. we will baptize younger kids. My, we actually baptized my daughter Evie last, last Sunday. Yeah. yeah. I saw that. So, That's awesome. She wanted to make an outward expression of an inward faith, which is what kind of the buzz thing to say. But it's it it was a, a visual representation representation for her to to say this is something I believe. I also got to baptize one of our youth, and he comes from a really broken home and, and didn't really grow up in the church and doesn't mm -hmm. have a father figure or anything else like that. And I mean, that was beautiful. He, he he cried on my arm right after I dunked him. You know, just wow. it was so overwhelming for him and. And so, yeah, we take it we take it very seriously, and I, I, it's been really neat to see as the kind of snowball effect of that. Hmm. If we see more and more people who are not just, like I said, people who grew up in the church or maybe Christians who are just kind of making a new commitment, but these people who have come from darkness to light, like, and there's no, hmm. you know, denying that that's what it is. Like we're saying with all of this, it's shaping the people's hearts in that room, right? And so when they yep. see someone get up there and say, "I was this, but now I'm this," yeah, and then they're like, "Oh." Well, I'm still that. I, I want to be that though. Like, how do mm -hmm. I get there? You know, and those those questions start to happen, um, and it's just really cool how that you know God uses not that as as an evangelistic way to to continue the kingdom of Jesus. You know, um, and I think some yeah. people think, oh, that's just being swept up in emotion, and maybe it can be, but I think m more often than not, it's people realizing this and God using that as and the whole uh, um, to speak directly to people's hearts in them. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we're. I was talking about that yesterday with somebody. 
the importance of uh, proclamation. Hmm. And like in this example, like seeing in the middle of a service what God is doing in somebody's life. Right. I think one thing we have to be careful with, well, with everything we do in the church, but specifically talking about baptism is just like making it part of the program. Mm, right. And that can definitely, I've seen that where we have to push against that at our church because we're a part of a big church and we have multiple services. So things have to be like ordered, right? Mm-hmm. You have to keep things like organized. You just have to guard against that idea of like, wow, we've got a lot of baptisms. That's going to take up a lot of time. Mm-hmm. We need to make sure this is really like everyone's ordered. Everyone's like in and out, you know, like boom, boom, boom. You can't get into that. Like you can't get into that mindset yeah, just because of how significant it is that I mean, this is what we're doing. We're right. the, like the reason we preach every week. The reason we do all this is so that people's lives are transformed. Mm. That's what we're showing right here. So I just think that's really important to maintain that weight yeah. of it. And that's yeah. the that's the case with everything we do in the church, with worship songs, with our sermon, with our response, with our baptisms and communion mm. is making sure it's not just becoming part of the program yeah. that we do, mm-hmm. but that what the truth of what we're doing remains yeah. present in, in our minds. Mm-hmm. I've been struggling with that a little bit at our church because the way they've been doing baptisms is they'll do it right in the middle of worship. It'll be like, um, we'll sing a verse and then shift over. They do the baptism and then we go into the chorus. And it feels so much like a program to mm-hmm. me. Like it's just another aspect of the production almost. And that's yeah. being a little bit harsh, but I've I've been struggling through that. Hmm. I mean, I think that there could be a place for that because it may be that what they're going for is some like worship, worshiping God for what he's done in the lives of these people Mm -hmm. by continuing to worship God for that. Mm -hmm. We always respond afterwards and we have Mm -hmm. some former Church of Christ people at our church. And I say former because they, (laughs) once you leave, you're kind of out of the Church of Christ. (laughs) Um, uh, But they uh, they talk about, you know, they, they, they put a little bit too heavy, in my opinion, too, too heavy an emphasis on what baptism means for your salvation but Mm. what they do well they've told me i've I've actually seen this but what they do well is that they really celebrate through music and and they don't use instruments in church of christ but just bursting out and singing and song and excitement after after someone baptized and so we we try to model that a little bit as well we don't do that during the baptism but there is a response what does that response look like like do you do a song or yeah a song and then um you know, one thing I stole from your dad is that we do a, a five minute break in the middle of our service for coffee. Oh, nice. <laughs> and we, but we, we take that very seriously as a, you know, this is a, a really great chance for you to, you know, welcome new people and say all that, but also like go pray with people if you need that. But then also like for people to just run up and celebrate that person who just, that they knew who just got baptized. And yeah. When you've walked alongside, if you've never done this, if you're listening to this and you've you've been a Christian for a while and you've never lo- walked alongside someone who has rejected the faith or never been a part of it, and then mm. it's suddenly the Lord just clicks in their heart um, and the Holy Spirit comes alive in their life, there's nothing mm. like that. You, I don't know how you can't be moved <laughs> to tears, you know? I think that you need something to kind of outwardly proclaim the mm. goodness of who Jesus is in that time. So we, we try to do that. Mm. Yeah. And, and we want to make sure that like, people are there to celebrate because it's not just our church that usually who's walked alongside those people. And a yeah. lot of times people are want their families who are still lost to come and say, hey, this is, I, I know you don't believe this, but can you come and see this? And it's neat to mm. see their hearts change because mm-hmm. of that, you know, so. You mentioned that uh, your daughter Evie just recently got baptized, uh-huh. which I saw the pictures of that and, <laughs> It's just awesome. But what were some of the things, processes that led up to her baptism? Um, What did that process look like? We have taken her her growth seriously since she was born. And so I think that, I think parents sometimes underestimate the role of their personal discipleship in the lives Mm. of their children. I know Joel understands this as a youth pastor and you, you know, like how often parents just say, okay, hey, you've got my kids. Right. Like uh, you're shaping them, right? You know, I'm hope I'm banking on you to shape them. We didn't want to do that, and so like we've done intentional things like the New City Catechism. Highly recommend that. We've used that a lot. That's been really helpful. Um, the Jesus Storybook Bible. We highly recommend that if you haven't used that. Yeah. You know, I think if you sat my daughter down right now, asked her some pretty heavy theological questions, I think she could probably answer it in her words, but it would still be pretty mm-hmm. close to being accurate, mm-hmm. um, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But we didn't want this to be something that was just her 
regurgitating the memorization that we've taught her, but right. is this real in your life? Like, do you really believe this or you just want, you're doing it because everybody else is doing it. And mm-hmm. <laughs> you, I said in her baptism of Evie, which Evangeline, I mean that she's living up to her name. I've watched her share Jesus mm-hmm. with multiple children and playgrounds and in pool gar- pools and things like that. So um, awesome. she, she prayed with a kid in Florida. Like, I mean, evangelism has never been my easy gift. <laughs> so I, mm. I, I know, I wish I could say we modeled that well, but I think it's more just the work of the Holy Spirit in our heart, you know? Yeah. And then one thing we do when we talk about communion, we say that's for all baptized believers. Mm. So therefore our children don't participate in communion until they're baptized. And when they finally get to take it, like Evie got to take communion for the first time, last week and it was so wow. special um her mom got to do it and i was i was fortunately leading worship but i was i got to watch her and i was crying while i was singing and for her to say you know this is the body and blood of christ sister that was really cool so moving into communion then yeah talk a little bit about that what does that look like in your church how have you seen it done well and you know with both of these things uh There's definitely a practical component when you're, like Joel said, when you're planning a church service, Hmm. um, you know, how are we going to do this effectively? If it's a large church, it can take a long time to administer the elements. So there's definitely a practical nature in this too, but how have you seen it done well and how do you guys typically do it? So the way we typically do it, I mean, COVID's kind of thrown a little bit of that off for a while and the way we've had to go back to the little individualized start yep. cardboard Jesus. I'm not a big fan of uh, it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah. uh, our Tenebrae service right before Easter is the first time we used like our real, real bread, again. Real bread uh, and juice again. And I was like, I have been complaining about this for like a year and a half in all of our staff meetings that we haven't gone back yet. I'm like, this this fast food communion is awful. Uh, it's <laughs> it's I terrible. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> um, so... But I get it. I get it for sure. Yeah, I'm grateful for um, whoever invented that is, is making lots of money because every church in America <laughs> had to go through that for a while. So, so we we do communion at post sermon every week. Okay. Usually the sermon will lead into that in some capacity. Um, and some of the, one of the things I say both in song and and communion is that no matter what is preached up there, if it's totally off yeah hopefully it's not <laughs> but let's say something ha- or we have a guest preacher or something like that happens you know it, yeah. it, it just happens some ser- sermons are just i mean it's 52 weeks out of a year maybe one of those is not going to be the best right you know um uh, unless you're ralph ziegler right but other than that like <laughs> this is a chance every single week for the gospel to be proclaimed um, mm-hmm. articulately. And so we most recently we've pulled partly from the Book of Common Prayer, which is an Anglican um, yeah. prayer book or, or their kind of order of worship and the way that they do stuff. And one of the things that they have in there, which is pretty neat, that it's already built in. The liturgy is basically just from 1 Corinthians. And so it's just taking scripture. So there's nothing really like, we like to think of these like high church concepts, like, no, it's just scripture, you know? So we're just, mm-hmm. we, we read that built in with that kind of like sections for us to pause and reflect on the nature of God. And um, there's a little bit of a call and response. And then we take um, people come to the front when they're ready. And we have people who, when they administer the elements, they say the body of Christ broken for you, brother, sister, it's the blood of Christ shed for you, brother, sister. Mm. Um, And then we have a couple of songs at the end to kind of respond again, like we did with baptism response to what God's done in that. Hmm. What we're talking about here with communion and just the beauty and the depth of communion mm-hmm. kind of parses out a little bit the importance, talking about catechesis, that's our topic, right? right? Like the teaching and shaping that happens in the act of communion, but there's also the teaching and shaping that happens prior, mm-hmm. right? And so when you've had a sermon or a class or read a book or something on communion, how much richer it makes the actual practice. That's right. And so that's the goal of like giving a sermon on communion. It's like, all right, I'm going to teach you guys all this. And I hope it's not just for today. Mm -hmm. Like, I hope this is something that's going to shape your experience of communion for the rest of your life as you remember these things. Mm. And like, for me, that was really significant when I read John Wesley's sermon on the means of grace. Mm. And he just talks about how, Like there's these certain things that God has chosen to give us in order to like impart his grace and communion is one of these things. And so I guess he just articulated it differently than I had ever heard it before. 
But ever since then, with, this was in, when I was in college that I read this. And like every time I've taken communion since then, it's been a richer experience mm. because I'm aware of God's grace being imparted into my life mm. when I take communion, like in the physical action. Mm. And so it's just the importance of like when you've been taught these things, how much it can affect your your worship. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. So we got to teach. That's why one of the reasons it's important to teach people. So one of the gifts of being a pastoral role in our church too, is that you get to spend a lot of times individually with people and see kind of what they're going through. Um, and as a worship leader, I think there's a lot of worship leaders who like, they just sing on Sundays and maybe, mm-hmm. and they're not really in people's lives. And this is, kind of goes for pastors as well. They're not really in people's lives throughout the week. They're just kind of preparing for Sunday, which is mm-hmm. a big thing. And I understand I'm not diminishing that, but there's a richness to when I'm leading a song and I suddenly see someone's hands go up in worship or start crying or whatever. And I know why they're doing that because I know what, yes. what they're going through in that moment. And I think it's the same thing with like when someone has learned something, especially if we walked through something with someone and yeah, they suddenly, you see, you can almost literally see it click. Like, yeah, oh, that's right. We talked earlier about kind of how a lot of modern churches don't really do catechesis mm-hmm. like formally. Yeah. And, um, sorry. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) one of the reasons for that is anytime you just focus so much on like the knowledge side, Mm -hmm. sometimes like you don't have the heart. And so a lot of the more contemporary worship and contemporary movement really focused on that, like personal encounter with God, personal experience of Mm -hmm. God. Yeah. Not just head knowledge. Right. And uh, that's healthy, but I think what we're talking about is trying to like unite those two things. Exactly. Yep. Right. The knowledge and how that builds into your experience. That's it's right. not just about the knowledge and it's not just about raising kids and church people who can say the right things. Like you're talking about with, with Evie, you don't just want her to be able to say the right answers. You wanted to see that the experience of Jesus was happening in her life. That's right. Mm-hmm. And like, that's what we want is with our people is to get both of those things. Absolutely. And so like a lot of people are a part of churches where they focus on one or the other more. And that's probably going to happen. You're probably going to like maybe lean more toward making sure people are experiencing God or lean more toward people are like learning about God. Right. But we really want to unify those two things. That's right. Mm -hmm. We talk about like that different churches, God has ignited different parts of that passion for them, you know, Um, and the the entire body of Christ. Like we need to lean on each other. Right. Um, And so as if there is a church that has done a better job of, of catechizing their children, you know, and adults, like we should not try to reinvent the wheel and think we understand it. Like let's learn from those people. You know, um, mm-hmm. if someone's mm-hmm. more passionate about igniting the the truth to the life, um, part of, of, of them, like let's learn from that. I believe this is kind of a side tangent, but I believe that God's uniting the church, um, again. And I think that's what's happening. Um, mm-hmm. and I'm seeing that more and more as people go, Hey, like we have missed this for for generations, whatever that mm. thing is. Um, and another church is like, yeah, we've gotten that, but we've missed that other thing that you got really well. Like, okay, well, let's yeah. talk about that. And so I think that there's, there's such a need for both. And um, I think we're in a f- really exciting time for the church to see, I think so too. see God kind of intersect some of that more and more. Yeah. I really think the whole internet age of the church is helping to unify the church because we're able to see what other churches are doing so much more. And people are just less isolated, right? right? Mm-hmm. And so there's so you hear so much more often people not caring about the differences between their specific denominational practices right. or whatever, That's right. Yeah. right? I hear that so often. Is and there's like much more of a unity in the type of worship music we choose. Mm-hmm. Like the amount, I think the percentage of churches that sure. sing the same songs is way higher than it ever has been, absolutely, because of the internet, right? And the fact that churches are able to share yeah. their preaching and share their worship and share their ideas. Mm. And so I, I agree with you. I do think that's happening and it is really exciting. Absolutely. I think also he's, he's shedding some of the stuff that we've taken to, to be important that really isn't, you know, like he's mm. getting rid of a lot of, of, I don't want to, uh, idolatry might be a little bit strong, but maybe, you know, um, the idolatry mm. in our churches of things that we've said, this is correct and your thing's wrong, or we've just always done this. Sometimes we need to reevaluate like, okay, is this really from the Lord? Um, is this really something that's yeah. going to edify and build up the kingdom of God? Or is this just something we've always done? And if is it mm. keeping us from being 
the kingdom of God in our city because we're using it as a tool to not connect with other believers, then that can't be from the Lord, right? So yeah. let's let's maybe reevaluate that. Well, Caleb, man, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Absolutely, this was fun. Really yeah. fun to hear your thoughts and also also just to hear what God's doing in your church too. It's encouraging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Grateful, y'all. All right. Is that the is that the end? (laughs) (laughs) Done. Cut. And cut.